Good afternoon, everyone. This is um, Christine Cristobal, and welcome to the California Healthcare Foundation's Opioid Safety Coalition's webinar. Um, thank you for joining us today. The topic of our webinar is setting up your coalition for success. Um, we we um, notice and are learning from all the coalitions that you all are doing a great job of kicking off your coalitions if they are new or kind of rejuvenating your coalitions if you've been around for a year or more. Um, and uh, we've been learning a lot from how everybody's setting up their infrastructure and um, their work groups. And um, we thought that it would be great to hear from a couple of coalitions um, and some of their tips and tricks. And um, we have the opportunity to hear from two um, coalitions operating in very different parts of California. We'll be hearing from the Humboldt County Coalition, uh, Dr. Mary Means and Rosemary Denowden from the, they are from the Humboldt Independent Practice Association. Um, so they are up in Humboldt area. And then we'll also be hearing from the San Diego Coalition and Linda Bridgman Smith um, will be here from the um, County of San Diego Health and Human Services Agency, Behavioral Health Services, um, to talk with us about how they've been setting up their coalitions for success. So we'll hear about um, them forming their coalitions, how they've recruited participants, and the kinds of structures that they're setting up. So a couple of housekeeping um, pieces are that you are all muted. We are recording this session so that your colleagues can listen to it later. And if you have any questions, we're going to hold questions until um, right after each set of presenters. So if you have any questions, please do type them up into the questions box. Um, Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Mary Mings, who is the medical director of the Humboldt IPA, and Rosemary Denowden, chief operating officer of the Humboldt IPA. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is Mary Mings. I'm going to be going through our slides, and um, Rosemary will help me if I get stuck or with our questions. And um, but you're, it's my voice that you're hearing, and uh, I will echo that I'm really glad that we're going to be followed by San Diego because um, a lot of our, um, the steps we took and how we developed um, wouldn't happen, I don't think, in a large metro area. So we'll represent the, uh, the rural uh, counties and, uh, and coalitions. Um, we usually start our story, the story of our uh, coalition, with talking about Humboldt County um, we use the phrase a lot behind the redwood curtain. It uh, refers to how remote we are, how isolated. Um, it's challenging to get in and out of here. We're up in the corner of the state behind all these beautiful trees. It's a large county, three times the size of Rhode Island, but sparsely populated. We have a, a higher rate of poverty than the state average. We have no integrated health care system here. and. Um, it's been said more than once and only partly joking that uh, maybe the solution to some of our challenges would be if we had a, a Sutter or a Kaiser or something up here, maybe a little occasional Kaiser envy, just because of things that can be done in an integrated healthcare system. Those are non-starters pretty much for us. We have a diminishing primary care workforce and we know we're not unique in that. Um, there are a few private practices uh, still going, um, although in the last few years, more and more of our uh, clinicians in Humboldt work either for our large safety net clinic, which is called Open Door, or they work for um, Humboldt Medical Specialists, which is a group mostly specialists that um, is run by the foundation associated with our major hospital. Um, we have actually four pain specialists, which is kind of a lot for our area, but they just mostly do injections, and we don't have any integrated pain center or sort of holistic or multidisciplinary specialist in treating pain. We're low on specialists anyway. We have no rheumatologist right now, for example. Um, we don't have a methadone clinic. As far as I know, we never have. Um, we have umpteen different EMRs. Um, 
like it seems like n minus one for every practice or provider up here, which means a lot of the um, a lot of the steps that could be taken with building things into an EMR aren't going to work for us. We have one main hospital, um, and it's administered non-locally, and it's about to transition to a different network that's also managed outside of California. So there's a few of our challenges. Uh, but what we do have to counterbalance that is because we're small, we know each other pretty well, sometimes we play well together, and our coalition structure, the secret is that the foundation of this ha was already in place um, before our first conversations about opiate use or uh, chronic pain management. Um, and that was in the form of a twice monthly meeting that uh, the IPA is the convener or the host of. We call that uh, care improvement meetings that have been going on for years on the second and fourth Friday of the month. And anybody in the county, anybody in our large community is invited that has anything to do with healthcare. So there's a, a di diverse representation from organizations and agencies that can share the work they're doing. Uh, there's opportunities to collaborate on grants and campaigns of different types. So this is a very, um, really great meeting. And um, a couple years ago, the public health department, who's um, a regular attendee, presented from their uh, community health assessment report. And um, this is one of the slides they showed us at that time, um, just to highlight that in Humboldt County, the drug-induced death rate was 36.7 per 100,000 compared to the California rate, which was 10.9. So over between three and four times, and there's different ways to slice and dice that, and it usually comes up that the magnitude of our problem is three to four times the state average. Um, you can see down the, the, the bottom um, uh, statistic in that graph, rate of years of potential life loss due to unintentional overdose. In Humboldt County, 830, and for California, a little under 300, almost three times. Some interesting um, information at the top speculating about why rural California counties tend to have worse problems. And again, we know if we don't, if we're not leading in a statistic, perhaps Lake County is. Um, some of the other rural counties have similar problems. And you can argue whether our geographic isolation causes the problem. Um, or if we attract um, people that bring the problems with them. Um, and we also are sort of famous for our uh, perhaps tolerance of substance use up here, although not everybody shares that. Um, this is another slide that we, we saw from public health a couple years ago. And this is a, a sort of familiar graph to a lot of you that shows that at a national level that uh, drug overdose deaths exceeded those deaths from motor vehicle accidents approximately in 2008. But Humboldt County national leader that we are, we achieved that uh, phenomenon a few years ahead of the rest of the country around 2005. And we have a lot of traffic fatalities here. So this was um, got a lot of people's attention. So after that presentation, the uh, Friday uh, twice monthly meetings became more and more uh, dominated by conversations about our problems with chronic pain, with opiate dependence and abuse and overdose, by primary care physicians feeling overwhelmed with managing their chronic pain patients and their um, pain, pain med seeking patients. And we decided to, uh, to, to make one of those meetings every month to focus on this so that we uh, had time to talk about other things. And then this became our fourth Friday meeting, um, the one that Dr. Kubota just attended last week. Um, this is a large meeting, large for us, 20 or 25 people usually, who want to be updated on all the details of the work we're doing. And um, around this time, we, we formulated our initial call to action. And this was a large evening meeting in November of 13, we we spent some time um, on our invitation list, and we were pretty pleased with who who came to this um, meeting. Our staff and public health partnership health plan, which was uh, new in our area at the time, um, uh, managed Medi-Cal, 
clinic administrators and PCPs, pain specialists, a dentist, pharmacist, someone from the coroner's office, county mental health, and hospital administration. Um, we, there was, again, presentation of data, both local and national, to um, sort of make the case for the scope of the problem and the need for work. And we also uh, heard from the leaders of the uh, Open Door, the Safety Net Clinic, as well as our Indian Health Service um, group, who had both been doing some work on uh, guidelines and uh, organizational work. And they, they told us about what they had done and results that they are seeing. And we also talked about a couple out, groups outside our area who we had studied. Um, one of those was called the Lazarus Project in North Carolina. And uh, we learned about what that community had accomplished that started out with a, you know, a star football player accidental overdose. And they were so successful that they spread their efforts across the state. And we also studied and presented at that meeting about what Kaiser had done in Southern California. So at the end of that evening, we asked um, everyone there to indicate if they were interested in working on any work groups or how they wanted to stay involved with us. And um, we brainstormed and came up with four work groups that we thought were priority to start with. Um, one of those was data, which was basically public health continuing to provide us with um, all kinds of information, both countywide and statewide from CURES. Um, they, they showed us hot spotting maps that helped us to uh, uh, focus our outreach efforts to different clinics. And they showed us, for instance, that at the beginning of our work, our um, MED, morphine equivalent average for Humboldt County was uh, 72, which, um, as many of you can quickly calculate, equals uh, over 14 Vicodins every day for every person in the county. So that's been a, a statistic that we've uh, quoted many times and gets a lot of people's attention. That all comes from our public health. We have a great epidemiologist that's part of our plan, part of our efforts. We began a standards and guidelines group, which again reviewed all the existing local and national guidelines and came up with our own for our community that we're in agreement um, with those. Another work group, coordination and communication. This is a really important group to, to it's made up of um, people who work in the hospital and the emergency rooms to address all of the mess ups that happen when even the most stabilized patient uh, with their PCP who maybe has a care plan and a medication agreement for their pain meds ends up in the ED or admitted to the hospital, how uh, everything can fall apart really quickly. And they've had some successes, like um, a, a, a pain med prescribing policy that's been accepted by all our EDs. Um, but getting all the individual docs to follow them is, is another challenge. Um, most of our ED docs and our hospitalists are locums, and they're not necessarily devoted to the um, the goals of our community. So this is an um, important and challenging work group that I think will continue to meet forever. Um, we talked about a, a pain board. Uh, we wanted to see if we could develop sort of a multi-specialty, um, a multidisciplinary uh, group, a couple specialists who would hear cases and help PCPs with their most difficult um, pain med patients. This one is, uh, this group is tabled for now. We did a little surveying and we're not sure that enough PCPs would show up to take advantage of this. Sometimes they have to travel 45 minutes in the middle of their work day to get to us or any central location. So we'll probably um, pick this up again in the future and look at some virtual technology for accomplishing sort of a, a project echo type of dissemination of expertise. So those groups were all meeting, and meanwhile, our call to action continued. And I have some examples here of uh, different pieces that represent um, our messaging to uh, various parts of our community. This is an article I wrote um, in June of 14 that went out to our constant contact list, which is 400? 400 clinicians, but 400. over 6,000 people subscribe to that. Okay, so pretty good distribution for our population. And this is just one of a series of articles I wrote. This one in particular was inspired 
by the um, the state medical board uh, report that I received regarding um, one of our docs who lost his license because of his pain med prescribing and um, all of the specific infractions. And I sort of just took that whole document and turned it into a, a do and don't list. Um, the next piece is a, this is a PowerPoint from a presentation that a lot of us gave about a year ago to a group called the Community Health Alliance. Um, there were a lot of people there that don't necessarily come to our care improvement meetings, but um, I think that that at a community level is a sort of a similar idea. It's a, uh, all kinds of um, healthcare associated people from the county heard in some detail about our problem and our work. Um, the next slide is an article that Rosemary and I were interviewed for by the Lost Coast Outpost. This is an online um, news source that um, a lot of people, this is all they look at anymore. And this was a long article that ran in January, um, again, about the problem and the work being done. And the last one is a slide we just added yesterday. So um, THCF, you didn't even get this in your version, because this was an article that ran in an Arcata paper last week about our presentation to the Board of Supervisors on March 15th in recognition of March being a Prescription Drug Abuse Awareness Month. Um, one of our uh, coalition members wrote a proclamation which the Board of Supervisors accepted and a bunch of us presented. And I would say it was quite well received. They were very, um, you know, very interested and engaged. Uh, and that was really our first formal um, uh, meeting with our elected government. So those were some examples of our call to action. This, the next slide is uh, some examples of how we uh, leveraged events and, and connections in our community. And I'll say that one thing I didn't list on this slide, but it's really important, is uh, this past fall when we, uh, when we got the grant from CHCF that um, that connection and uh, opportunities really launched us um, forward and um, in some new and important directions. But one thing that was very um, important in our story is that Partnership Health Plan uh, came here a couple years ago as the local administrative managed Medi-Cal. Um, within a couple months of them coming, they took OxyContin off their formulary. Um, Partnership or Medi-Cal represents is about 30% of the population of Humboldt County. So this is um, pretty meaningful. Um, and they have been an excellent partner in provider education. And um, they uh, are one entity that can really get good data through their um, prescription uh, monitoring. Um, and they've, they've showed dramatic success in the reduction of the volume of opiates prescribed in the last year or so for the partnership patients. So that's been really helpful to our coalition's work. Um, another example, and again, maybe some of the smaller communities can appreciate this. One of our nurses' husband is a pharmacist at an independent chain up here in Humboldt. He came to a few of our meetings and then he passed the ball on to one of his uh, coworkers, a pharmacist who was very interested in this who's really become a, a leader in our work groups. And he, he alone, and with working with others, has accomplished quite a bit, a really valued um, part of our coalition. Um, the medical director of our safety net clinic has a nephew-in-law who's a police officer in Arcata who's very interested in this. And he's become um, an attender of our, um, of our large group meetings. and. Another example of Rosemary ran into an old neighbor of hers when we were at the health fair this winter who works for the highway patrol as the public information officer. And now he's attending our monthly events and uh, seems pretty engaged to help us with uh, such things as um, we're trying to figure out now if there's a way to loop back on patient, on um, people who are arrested for uh, DUI which he reminded us can include prescription um, opiates as well as alcohol and illicit drugs, and uh, communicating back to their prescribers about their arrests. 
Um, this is sort of inspired by the recent article that showed 91% of people who are uh, successfully um, have an overdose reversed with Narcan go on to get um, future prescriptions for their opiates. So we're trying to figure out the, the actual steps to uh, reduce that 91%. Um, we got one of the Board of Supervisors to attend uh, one of our work group meetings just because someone at Public Health knew her and asked her. And um, some of the leaders in the local harm reduction efforts, which are often sort of citizen-led, um, have heard about our work and contacted us to join our coalition. Um, our current work group, so we've recently added a medication-assisted treatment group, and this is we're trying to identify several additional providers in our county to either get their X or use the X license that they have and prescribe buprenorphine, especially in areas on the north side, the south side, and the east side of our large county. Um, most of the medical offices and services are sort of in the center geographically of the county. And um, a lot of these uh, outside offices are, are small and they can't, um, they can't imagine how they could do uh, buprenorphine treatment, and we're looking for uh, alternate models and ways to mentor and support them. Our um, medical director of our safety net clinic, Dr. Hunter, has been prescribing buprenorphine for many years um, and has about 400 uh, patients now in their various locations. Um, one of our other new groups is uh, naloxone training and distribution. This is led by um, a public health education specialist who was already doing this work, and she managed to score, I don't even want to say it because um, you guys will be jealous, uh, um, thousands of uh, donated FZO kits uh, for the uh, automated injection uh, naloxone. And so that's a very robust uh, group with a lot of interest everywhere from uh, tribal governments and business owners and suicide prevention and very diverse group uh, working to expand the uh, training on overdose recognition and naloxone kit distribution. Um, Non-pharmacologic resources is a group we started about a year ago. We're working on developing a resource that lists uh, acupuncturists, behavioral health, uh, body work, et cetera, and who takes insurance, et cetera. Um, that, uh, that resource in paper and online should be ready in another couple months and uh, be valuable to patients and to um, providers. Marketing and public outreach is a group that started about a year ago. You've seen some examples of uh, some of the events and um, opportunities um, that have come out of that uh, group, and, and we have ideas and uh, need to do quite a bit more. Um, drug destruction, our pharmacist, um, just the day before yesterday, had a ribbon cutting on uh, disposal bins in the pharmacy lobbies that take controlled substances. And uh, this is a big accomplishment on his part because for several years we've had no legitimate um, outlet in our county for disposing of controlled substances. And just to interject, has already collected over 30 pounds of wow of destructed meds. Yeah. In, in, in less than 48 days. hours. Yeah. yeah. That, was, that was huge. And there were some obstacles on the way yeah. that he uh, persevered through. Um, those initial uh, groups, standards and guidelines, data, coordination, communication, they continue to meet. Um, we're working on revising our initial guidelines, uh, incorporating some of the CDC recommendations. And um, once we have an agreement on our, well, I won't say final because it could always be revised, but then we're going to be brainstorming on better ways to spread that word to the docs. Um, Additionally, you know, we've always been working all along on trying to encourage providers to register for cures and to use it, and public health as well as our medical society has offered assistance for that. Um, we have an organization up here called North Coast Clinics Network, which um, has been in our coalition and in our meetings all along, and they've been a sponsor for some of our CME events. And we've also taken over the IPA and agreed to support a uh, chronic disease self-management uh, module on chronic pain. It's called our Pathways to Health. Uh, we're going to be starting those classes again, which are free to anyone in the community uh, soon. Here's who's not yet at our table and who we have our eyes on. 
Um, we had a dentist at that first meeting, but not since then. We haven't been able to get the coroner or anyone from the sheriff's office back. And uh, they've been asked, and they say how short staffed they are, but we're going to keep trying. Um, we know that Marin has brought in and maybe other uh, coalitions, the district attorney. We've talked about private insurers. If partnership has had such um, major results by altering their formulary and putting limits on dosing, uh, maybe we should talk to the Blues about that. Um, we'd like more private practice um, providers to attend, and maybe even um, some people think pharma should have to pay for the drug disposal bin. Uh, going forward, we're going to start having a, an official steering committee, which would be a work group and coalition leaders to meet quarterly and, and do some strategic planning and review. So far, that's just happened within that monthly large group meeting, but we recognize the need for a dedicated meeting for that. Um, we're going to do more in-person detailing with prescribers and their staff, um, and uh, we're going to learn more and get more and more support and expertise from CHCF, which we're really grateful for. So I'm going to stop there, and I think we can take any questions for us right now for a few minutes before the second presentation. Great. Thank you so much, Mary and Rosemary. Um, that was an excellent presentation. It's great to get to know how you've set up your coalition a little bit in more detail. Um, I would encourage anyone who has questions to type them into the questions box. And um, Robert, are you seeing if there are any questions at this point? Not at this point. Okay, um, I have a question um, for you both. Um, you mentioned in the beginning of your presentation that you do have four pain specialists in your area. I'm curious, are they part of the coalition? Are they supportive of the work? You know, um, uh, two of them have attended at least one meeting, um, but they have not uh, actually accepted the opportunity to be very involved. So we should put them on the list, too, of um, who we need to pursue for, for more involvement. We, it's not for lack of inviting them. They can still get invited to every meeting. Um, Got it. Got it. Um, there is a question from um, Dr. Joel Hyatt from the Los Angeles Coalition, and he was wondering if you could share the guidelines that you all agreed upon. Well, yeah, I don't have a slide for that now, and uh, thank you. I recognize your name, Dr. Hyatt, because you were doing that work, the Kaiser work that I studied a few years ago, right? <laughs> I think so. Um, uh, those are currently under revision, and um, perhaps when, when that revision is done, I could forward them to CHPF. Is that yeah. acceptable? And once we have that final standards and guidelines, um, document, we are going to put that out on a, you know, a, a website so that it can be shared and disseminated. Um, and we're hoping to have that in a final version within the next few weeks. So absolutely. Yep. I agree. Great. Fantastic. Um, you had mentioned um, that you are going to be starting up your Pathways Chronic Pain Management programs. And I was curious about how else you think about engaging the public in this. Well, um, we do have two uh, consumers that sit on as a part of our, our larger group meeting. Um, and we really think about this a lot in both the public, the marketing and public outreach and the communication and coordination um, subcommittees. And it's really been a kind of a sticking point for us is to, to know exactly what information um, should be distributed and disseminated. And we really look to those um, consumer representatives to really help us weigh in, to weigh in on that. Um, you know, it is, it's tricky because, you know, for example, when we presented at the Board of Supervisors meeting, um, it was, we had to make a conscious effort to focus on prescribing of opiates and not um, divert into the heroin issue that often goes hand in hand with this. But, and we really uh, value the input from our consumer representatives to help us, 
you know, shape what it is that we're disseminating and um, how we're speaking about this. So, you know, at this point, through our Pathways to Health, the Chronic Pain workshops, and through our um, uh, coali coalition members, the consumer representatives, um, we hope to in expand our um, involvement of them, but that's really how we've included them thus far. Okay, great. And you seem to do a really nice job of leveraging your connections. You had that leveraging events and connections slide. Um, and so um, I'm wondering, uh, how do you leverage those relationships? Does that happen naturally or are you making specific asks? We're usually making specific asks, but sometimes the person with the connection is already at the table. And then they say, well, my, you know, my dentist, I mean, that's our next dream. If somebody said, I brought this up at my dentist. And yeah. He said he wants to help. That hasn't happened yet, but that's an example of how it has happened. Yeah, it's, you know, it's the, the positive of living in a small community where, you know, you, you know your neighbors and you're mm -hmm. working with them and, you know, you're related to some of them. And so, we, you know, leveraging those. And I think that can be applied in an urban setting as well, you know, just taking, you know, a thorough inventory of who do you know and who do you think should be included in our work here and not taking for granted any of those potential connections because, you know, like Mary said, you know, it's through a coworker or a relative or whomever and you, uh, you some through those get some of the best outcomes. Great point. Um, so uh, just uh, kind of going back a little bit to the earlier question around sharing the guidelines, um, Joel had a follow-up comment um, and he said that every coalition is probably trying to translate and adopt the CDC guidelines, so it'd be nice to share them all. And so absolutely, when once you're able to share that with us, we'll put it on the Google Drive and, and other examples of how people are um, translating and adopting the CDC guidelines, we'll share that so that um, everybody can learn from each other. Yeah, we'd like that too. Good. Okay. Excellent. Um, here is another. Um, it's she, so this is Sandy O'Farrell. So she says, also not a question, but a comment. Really appreciate that Humboldt is really exploring the whys of their data and didn't share just the numbers. Very interesting perspective. Yes. Yeah, it sounds like you have a good partnership with, an, with, your, with the epidemiologist at Public Health and you have an opportunity to kind of dive into um, why, that, why the numbers are, are um, the way they are. Yeah. Yeah, he always reminds us that, you know, the, the, the overdose data that the most common finding um, is, you know, mixed substances or alcohol plus anything. So, um, some challenges are going to be there in every municipality that, um, you know, it, it, there, there's a lag in the data, sometimes a year or so, and that uh, it, it's hard to get the, the data to every single question that you have. Um, but it's always valuable. Yeah, and if we, you know, and finding out the whys really helps us uh, shape our strategies to, you know, to improvement. Because if we don't understand, you know, why somebody is prescribing or where our hotspots are or, um, you know, the particulars of that small remote community, we're, we're not going to make a difference mm -hmm. because every community is different. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you very much. If people um, do have more questions, we may have time at the very end, or they can um, reach out to us at CHCF or directly to um, Mary and Rosemary. But um, I want to thank you both for your time and your presentation and sharing your perspectives. They're, they're great. Our pleasure. Okay. All right, so um, now we get to hear about a coalition operating in a very different part of California. Um, Linda Bridgman Smith, uh, DUI and Prevention Services Program Manager from the County of San Diego Health and Human Services Agency is here to talk about the San Diego Coalition work. Okay, Linda. Well, thank you. And uh, two questions. Can you hear me okay? And do you see the slides? Yes and yes. Awesome. 
So thank you for having me. I do want to let you all know that I am pitch hitting for Dr. Ronit Lev, who had a, um, she's actually at a conference in Atlanta, so I will try to do my very best. My role is to talk a little bit about the history of the Prescription Drug Abuse Task Force. Uh, the second thing is to talk about how we are structured. I'd also like to talk about the collective impact activities of the member organizations of the Prescription Drug Abuse Task Force, and then a little bit on uh, future goals. One of the things I'd like to share with you is down in San Diego County, we have a very long history of a multidisciplinary um, public health, public safety partnership. And where it really first started for us was in 1995. The picture in the corner is um, it shows a National Guard tank going down our Highway 805, and it was a really big deal. It got on national attention, and the individual who uh, stole that vehicle was a methamphetamine user. Our we started looking at data and our Board of Supervisors authorized the formation of the San Diego County Methamphetamine Strike Force in, uh, in about the spring of 1996. One of the things that I think has been really beneficial for San Diego County is, uh, unlike uh, Humboldt, we really are very large. There's 3.3 you know, million people here. We've got 17, excuse me, 18 cities plus the county's unincorporated areas. So we have 19 distinct uh, municipalities. We've got 17 hospitals, and we have both uh, urban and rural areas. So it's a it's a really large uh, area. And by working together across that spectrum between law enforcement, education, public health, it really has been incredibly beneficial for us. So in looking at prescription drug related information, uh, the thing that drives information in San Diego County is really deaths. Deaths really are, and, and I think that this is probably true at the local level everywhere, deaths really are the driver. So in the middle, the little graph in the middle, you can see between 2000 and 2002, we had a, a kind of an uptick. The red line is our drug-related and um, unintentional deaths and poisonings. And you can see in 2002, 2003, um, actually 2001 to 2002, we had an uptick, and then it kind of leveled out until 2006, 2007, and then we had another uptick. And like Humboldt County, our uh, unintentional drug-related poisonings really exceeds all other deaths, uh, unintentional deaths in, in our county, including motor vehicles and homicides. So this was, uh, this was uh, most definitely an attention getter for, uh, for our county and for our government structure. Um, we also looked at a variety of other indicators, and I'll talk about those in a little bit. Um, but one of the things that was really important for us was to take a look at uh, working with our epidemiologists and evaluators, uh, other subject matter experts, so that we could really take a look at the data, um, you know, talk about what it means, and um, also to identify stable, reliable, and available measures. As, a, as an outside group, even though we're the county, we wanted to make sure that no, you know, we didn't have to recreate uh, an existing wheel. We wanted to use what was already there and really look at it. And I, I think that that's an important takeaway for anybody who's looking at this issue or any other issue. What's already there? What is somebody else already getting, get those folks at the table and, um, and agree that this is important to continue to share. Um, so this is just our organization chart. We have our Prescription Drug Abuse Task Force. It actually started as the Oxy Task Force in 2008 because our medical examiner was reflecting that it was Oxycontin, Oxycodone, where the most of the deaths that that um, were popping up in 2006 and 2007 were um, in the oxy category. And then in 2010, uh, taking a deeper dive look at uh, um, the other medications that people were dying of, and we came to the realization that it really is a variety of prescription drug-related painkillers and medications um, 
and, um, and, and e even some over-the-counter medications. And so we renamed it in 2010 to the Prescription Drug Abuse Task Force. And we have an executive committee group, which is, uh, and I'll talk about each of these in a little bit, um, but they are uh, community-based organizations, state, federal, local law enforcement, and other really key decision-maker stakeholders. Then we have um, our medical task force, the pharmacy committee, we have a data team, and we have a safe, uh, a safe disposal team. So one of the things that I think is really important is to have a facilitator, somebody to boss me around. And our facilitator is Angela Goldberg, and she really is the glue that holds us all together. And, um, and then this is just the, the membership of our, um, our coalition um, that uh, you know Dr. Lev, she's down at the bottom, and to her on the right side, uh, that's, oops, on the right side, that's uh, Tom Lennox from uh, the DEA. So these are the folks that we get together on a regular basis and, and just talk about um, and, and do planning and, and strategic organization. Um, we also have a general membership, and this is um, various local, state, and federal law enforcement. These uh, folks are, we have a HIDA down here because we're right on the border, a uh, high intensity drug trafficking area. So that's a really um, key group for us as we look at these things. Um, we have put uh, the Poison Control Center has been very involved, and um, one of the things that I think is really uh, exciting about the, um, this particular group and some of the other groups that I am privileged to work with is it is um, there's uh, recruiting that goes on, and our facilitator Angela Goldberg she uh, uh, she's a bit like a little terrier nipping on people's heels all the time, and I'm generally grateful for that. Um, but it's also an organization of attraction, uh, just like. Like Humboldt shared that you know people know people who are interested the same thing happens in a really large county too and we've been able to benefit from that in a in a lot of ways um, we've got uh, two major Marine Corps bases here we've got two major Navy bases here and um, two Coast Guard bases and a small Army and National Guard group and so we're able to you know somebody knows somebody and um, we have the um, both camp, let's see Camp Pendleton uh, Marine Corps base is um, has joined our group in the last year and they are are very um, involved. We've also been successful in being able to attract the Veterans Administration and um, that, that took a while and it took a lot of um, terrier nipping at people's heels but that finally has, uh, um, has occurred which I think has uh, been beneficial for all of us. So um, this is the prescri Prescription Drug Abuse Task Force logic model and it really um, it has a single goal to reduce the misuse, abuse, and addiction to prescription medications in San Diego County. And it seems like such a simple thing, but I come out of prevention. I'm not out of the medical community. And before that, it was with substance abuse treatment and DUI. And so in looking at this, it's, oh, we don't want people to be using these things anyway. And because it's a bad thing. And I am obviously not a medical doctor. And so when we started engaging the medical community, what we were hearing from the medical community is we want people to use their medications as prescribed and, and, and to talk to their healthcare prescriber or provider to make sure that if there are any problems that you have those discussions. And so, um, so working to uh, refine that goal was, um, was really some important work for us to do. We also have three uh, objectives, and it's to increase the perception of harm related to prescription drug misuse, uh, to make sure that teens aren't misusing it, that people are not sharing it, um, and that it's just used as it is prescribed. The second objective is to increase uh, engagement in substance abuse treatment, and that would include the use of medically assisted treatments like naloxone. Um, and then the third thing is to reduce access to prescribed medications for uses that are other than prescribed. So with that, we'd want to uh, engage prescribers about um, good prescribing practices to promote collection of unwanted and unused medications, expired medications, to really um, um, just identify 
um, tools and, and um, resources for all of the various populations that we work with. Um, <clears throat> so our meeting structure. We have our executive committee meeting and that has about 15 people. We meet um, once a quarter and it really is our leadership group. Our data group re meets, um, they create a report card and I'll share that in a minute. Uh, we actually, this says that we meet once a year, but in truth that data group probably meets half a dozen times before that report card is released to really uh, have a conversation about what the data is, what does it mean, um, look at the data and whatnot. Um, we also have what we call planned media and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but it is by design doing um, media related things where a press release is written, a press conference occurs, uh, and we get um, uh, our people in our group to kind of support those things too so we can have a, a, an organized uh, strategic earned media, we're not buying spots, um, earned media release and I'll share a little bit of that with you. The, uh, the medical task force meets quarterly and that's under um, and Dr. Love through the uh, San Diego County and Imperial County Medical Society is really, um, um, they are very involved in that. The pharmacy groups, uh, the pharmacy group meets uh, every other month. And um, we also recently created a safe disposal meeting and one of the things that has evolved out of our safe disposal meeting is also taking a look at disposal of sharps, which was, uh, it was a, kind of a natural partnership and so we're very pleased with the way that that has occurred. We do have quarterly general meetings. These are open to the public. They are announced to the public and the public is encouraged encouraged to, uh, to attend and I, they are um, um, generally very well attended, 60, 70, 80 people and of those folks are some stakeholders but are also some just folks. I, uh, as a prevention person in my county, uh, alcohol and drug related prevention, I look at uh, you know known people and then just folks and so it's always really uh, encouraging to me when I see people that I know are not particularly affiliated with uh, another working group that we have in the county and what that tells me is we've been able to push information down and pique people's interests enough that they'll show up for a, um, a two-hour meeting on a Friday morning. It's, uh, it's really pretty cool. Um, and, and the topics of the general meeting discussion talks about um, prescribing things. We've had presentations from our campus police, uh, University of California, San Diego is here, San Diego State University is here. We've had their campus police talk about the uh, problems that they've seen from um, prescribed medication on the campuses proper. We've also had some drugged driving uh, and taking a look at the, uh, the um, over 55 population who is driving or who is um, has uh, about five prescriptions of which um, half of those may be uh, make them impaired or affect their driving in some way uh, as well as just drug driving of people driving under you know who are not over older than 55 but are driving impaired under prescribed medication or a combination of prescribed and illicit uh, drugs. We've also talked about safe disposal methods and then we always try to uh, include um, addiction and treatment and the message that treatment is available in San Diego County, that treatment works and that recovery is possible and um, we've had a variety of speakers on those topics. The uh, um, the medical task force, uh, our facilitator keeps the notes and uh, Dr. Love is the one who facilitates that. It's got a variety of, this is just a, a partial list of the groups that uh, participate in that, but there is pharmacy, the hospital association, dental association, pediatric association is kind of new. We've got the Indian health clinics. Uh, we have, uh, let's see, I think we have 18 distinct Indian, registered Indian tribes in San Diego County. Some of them have gaming interests, but most of them do not, and um, so we're really pleased that they are involved. We also have some interest from some local methadone clinics, and so that uh, we're very pleased about that as well. Um, so the medical 
the medical task force uh, created some consensus tools. And one of the first things was the safe prescribing guidelines. And this was a, um, we released these, San Diego County released these September 13th of 2013. And um, I'm pleased to say that uh, San Diego County and the Prescription Drug Abuse Task Force was recognized by the National Association of Counties and Achievement Award for, for um, putting this, uh, this particular document out. We're, we're really pleased in that my uh, personal story is I have Kaiser as a healthcare provider and this occurred in September of 2013. I did my regular physical in mid-January of 2014 and as while I was waiting for the physician to come, I looked on the bulletin board and there was um, both Spanish and English of the safe prescribing guideline in that, that room. So I was uh, very, very pleased um, to see that. I'm also pleased that uh, the California Department of Public Health actually adopted this um, and there was a press release that was sent out with uh, support on December 30th of 2014. Um, as I said a minute ago, the medical task force, they meet quarterly, they, um, um, they do um, updates and education, um, case studies, they've got, um, um, they've got some subcommittees that really look at emergency department guidelines, at urgent care guidelines, at medication agreements, um, treatment guidelines, providing naloxone education overall, and then also um, looking at pharmacy, um, pharmacy provider calling guide. One of the things that the, the doctors and the medical task force were concerned about is, well, do pharmacies want us calling them? And um, pharmacies said, yes, we do watch you calling us if you have a question. And so that's been a, a really um, um, excellent thing. And then there is recently a set of health plan guidelines that have been rolled out um, for our, medic, uh, our um, um, Medi-Cal um, providers in the county. And I'll talk about that in a minute, too. Um, for our pharmacy committee, those, that's the group that meets every other month, they've really been working on improving pharmacist and provider communications. They've developed some red flag prescription guidelines. Um, they've got a, a, a naloxone dispensing educational guideline. Um, there's um, uh, prescription drug abuse education. And then there's the uh, Gen Rex students, which is a project of Cardinal Health. And the um, UCSD School of Pharmacy has, uh, um, has been working with um, high school students um, or developing a, a presentation for high school students out of the School of Pharmacy. Um, the logos on the bottom, I wanted to point out, we've been very pleased to have Costco Pharmacy as part of our group. Um, Kaiser Permanente adopted the, uh, uh, those, um, um, they were really designed for the emergency department, but they, they adopted those things early on in Southern California. And the, uh, the San Diego County VA healthcare system is also a member, um, as is uh, our CVS um, um, uh, we have a local representative um, from CBS who has been very involved. Uh, this is our annual report card and we track nine indicators over the course of a year. Uh, the first one is the unintentional um, deaths and that does give a rate per 100,000. We also are tracking emergency department pain related discharges. Now this is kind of a lagging one and we get this from the state uh, Department of Healthcare Services. So it, it's, uh, it runs a little later. Um, it, it's, uh, I think that's the one that we get about two years, uh, 18 months or so, uh, it lags a little bit. The uh, student self-report of prescription drug misuse is the California Healthy Kids Survey, which is administered to 7th, 9th, and 11th graders in alternating years. Um, the uh, adult treatment admissions, are those are the folks that are admitted into um, publicly funded substance abuse treatment, and they have identified either heroin or prescription painkillers as their primary drug of choice. In San Diego County, we also have an arresting monitoring. So um, every year in both the adult and juvenile um, detention facilities, juvenile hall and our detention facilities, they'll go in and do drug testing, um, just prevalence uh, survey data, and that's what um, number five is. Um, 
let's see. One of the things that uh, Humboldt shared was the number of pills that were dispensed. Uh, we also look at that. And in San Diego, we've got 36.3 pills dispensed for every 3.3 million people in San Diego County, another 13 anti-anxieties, and um, almost five stimulants. Sorry, I'm watching the time, so I'm going to move forward. Um, so this, what this represents is the number of pills in each of our regions. We have um, six regions under the Health and Human Service Agency. And so the red one uh, is showing that there are 6.8 pills dispensed for every person who is living in East County. I point that one out because number one, it's the highest one. It's also the region of the county that I live in. And I currently am taking no prescribed medications at all. So those pills from before, somebody's taking mine too. Um, Dr. Love and Dr. Jonathan Lucas, our medical examiner, have, uh, they co-authored a piece that we call the Death Diaries here. And what this did was it looked at um, deaths in San Diego County in calendar year 2013, of which 254 were identified as having prescriptions in their system. Um, and this is uh, not just prescriptions, but as Humboldt indicated, uh, um, people use multiple substances. This was uh, taking an extensive look at, at the CARES data. And of those 254 deaths, 186 of them were, uh, hold on, let me just double check my note here, um, 186 were actually in CARES. There were 68 of those people who died with pharmaceuticals in their system who were not in the cure system, but 186 were. And um, in, in, uh, in the CURES data, uh, I would like to note that the um, Veterans Administration does not report to CURES, nor does Balboa Naval Hospital, nor do the methadone clinics, and of course, um, the uh, inpatient hospitals don't either. But that was, uh, that was pretty uh, startling um, to us. Um, when they were taking a look at that. Of those 254 deaths, there were a total of 713 prescribers. And Dr. Lev always identifies these prescribers as people who work here, who have good reputations, and who she would refer to. Um, and most of them are family practice or internal medicine providers. And that they were... Um, um, over 50%. And then psychiatry was the second largest number of prescribers in, um, in our county. Um, so one of the things that, um, that we have identified is that, uh, that Dr. Love and, and Dr. Uh, Lucas have identified. And if you want more information about that, I'm not the best person to ask those questions of. That would be uh, Dr. Love or Dr. Um, um, Dr. Lucas. And, um, but one of the things that they have found is that 69% um, of those people who died, or 186 people, um, what CURES is reflecting is that 69% um, of them had used pain medications for more than three months of continuous use. And that, um, um, and that that's, that's really a concern. And um, the, uh, the numbers at the bottom I'd like to point out are, um, these are, these are uh, just numbers. This is not a rate. These are the actual numbers. And Dr. Love, um, at the bottom, the uh, census patient with Rx chronic use, these are her projections of, po um, of the size of the potential risk population. And, um, um, you know, just in doing, you know, some straight mathematical conjectures about the potential risk of, of uh, chronic abuse based on CARES information and other, uh, other data that she pulled. Um, so the, um, one of the other things that the death diaries showed us is that in San Diego County, 46 of those 254 deaths also had methadone in their system. And that of those methadone-related deaths, or um, seven of them had information in cures, but 39, or 85% of them, did not. 
And um, methadone as a medically assisted treatment is really important. But it also identifies a weakness in our system that because methadone is not required to report into cures in California, there's a really large potential for unintentional deaths either due to, you know, somebody going to an emergency department for whatever reason and not having um, really good information about the medications that they are taking available to that emergency department um, physician so that they can um, um, prescribe appropriately. Um, so Dr. Love also, in San Diego County, there is uh, an emergency medicine oversight commission that is under the San Diego County Medical Society, and she does annually, she does a, a survey with that group of folks, and she has found that there is um, a really good awareness amongst the physicians, the emergency department physicians of the physician guidelines, and um, that um, she also found out in the last survey that five of our 17 hospitals give out that emergency department um, safe medication prescribing guidelines to everybody. In 10 hospitals, they give it out to selected patients. And there are two hospitals in San Diego County that are not using it, uh, that are not using it at all. So one of the things that uh, the, Dr. Love Prescription Drug Abuse Task Force and the San Diego County Medical Society are really looking at is um, a, a single vision for San Diego County. And that would be that they have one provider and one pharmacy, um, that the second thing is that physicians will all use cures, that a medication agreement would be utilized appropriately, that, um, that there not be any opioid or benzodiazepines dual prescriptions because that really is a, um, a, a high propensity for for um, um, unintentional death and for um, physicians and prescribers, uh, hospitals and healthcare associations to really honor um, those whole emergency department guidelines around that physicians care about you and they, um, they don't want to give out medication through the emergency department inappropriately. Um, one of the things that I would like to share is that the Veterans Administration here has um, shared with us that there's a national decision that they are no longer going to um, just allow opioid and benzodiazepines to be um, prescribed without a waiver. It can be done if it's medically ne necessary, but it needs to be done using a, a, a waiver um, to override the system. The system itself will not allow that to occur. Um, so Dr. Love has described two, um, two types of populations, and for me, there's, um, 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 there's the, you know, the prevention, dealing with pain that people are having right now, and then weaning. I'm not a physician, so I'm going to talk about weaning, but in my world, we talk about for people who are, um, who are addicted and that they need substance abuse treatment and that we would want to make sure that people know that drug treatment is available and know where to go and get that. Um, let's see. Uh, one of the things that um, is being worked on now is to work with uh, pediatrics um, and the Pediatric Association. They already do bicycle safety projects, and it seems completely reasonable that to um, get to communicate to them, to start having them talk to their patients about locking up medications, that they count the medications, they dispose of it properly, and, um, and that they avoid it if, uh, if possible. Um, let's see, we are working with, um, um, we're using the uh, partnership health plan that Humboldt County was talking about. That has been um, discussed with the Medi-Cal providers down here, which uh, their logos are at the bottom of the slide, and they've been uh, very receptive to that. And um, um, so we, uh, this is continuing work. I'm going to move on because we're getting late. Uh, one of the things San Diego County is doing is we've got naloxone distribution by the San Diego County Sheriff's Department. And through December 31st of 2015, the Sheriff's Department has counted 23 saved lives. Um, it started out initially as a pilot project in Santee, which is a community in that red area of East County on that map that you saw earlier. It started out as a six-month pilot because they had the largest number of opioid 
overdoses in our county, and that was in July of 2014. Uh, it was successful that it moved out countywide in March of 2015, and one of the unique pieces to this is that there is training for every patrol officer in San Diego County, and they have kits in their vehicles. They are the first law enforcement organization to have every patrol car outfitted with naloxone. And when naloxone is administered, the, the uh, individual is taken to the emergency department, and an information packet is left with the family that includes um, information about local substance abuse treatment. Now, they can't compel anybody to get into the treatment, but at least that information is left with the, um, with the individuals who are, um, who are there at the home. Um, our safe take back vents, we collect, uh, we usually have about 40 sites and we get about 30,000 pounds a year. Uh, we actually have an ordinance and every one of our substations, which total I think 23 or 24 in San Diego County, have a drop box, as do some of our municipal police departments. Um, one of the things that's really important for us is, is um, those key stakeholders, and these are, um, these are non-governmental groups that are involved, and they are, they are really that family voice, those stakeholders and consumers, uh, those, those are really important folks in our group. Um, this is a little bit about earned media. The picture in the lower left is the uh, September 13th, 2013, when the pre safe prescribing guidelines rolled out. And, um, and I'm not sure when that other picture was taken in the upper right-hand corner, but we do earned media, and um, we really see that as uh, uh, really important to communicate to the population about what's going on. Um, let's see. Um, in the lower right-hand corner, our, uh, this was at last year's uh, Take Back event, and um, all the students who helped with a Saturday Take Back, they, uh, they dressed up as uh, pill bottles, which uh, got a lot of attention. Um, and we have a lot of youth groups and things that are involved. Uh, it's just part of the infrastructure of what we do. Um, the Prescription Drug Abuse Task Force is sponsored or um, presented at uh, six different um, conferences, statewide conferences. The last one was in, uh, let's see, I think it was in November of last year, and um, um, so we're excited about that, and it was, uh, it was really, uh, it was a fun-filled day. Um, our wish list is that, um, that patient satisfaction is often an obstacle to safe prescribing because people equate getting medication with a, a good medical experience and you name the medical provider. So we'd like to uh, see some um, move around removing you know, some of the patient satisfaction questions. Um, that cures really is a gold standard and it needs to be used all the time by everybody. Um, and let's see, um, the, the list is there. Uh, let's see. And here's references. Um, all of the resources that we have in San Diego County are available at the websites at the top. Uh, you can contact our facilitator, Angela Goldberg, um, uh, Dr. Painter from UCSD, um, or um, Ronit Lev. Um, all of their information is there, and I'm done. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Linda. Really um, such a, a strong coalition with a lot of rich strategies um, and um, activities that are happening. Um, I did say we would go for um, about 10 more minutes. So I just want to see if there are any burning questions that people have who are still on the webinar with us. If you have um, a question or two, maybe we could take one or two um, in the question box. And um, while we see if um, a question pops up. Linda, could you say whether there were any key stakeholders that were missing or a challenge to engage and how you engaged them? Um, initially, our strongest challenge was getting the medical community involved. And it really took a lot of um, interactions, I think. And then uh, Dr. Love was kind of um, working um, you know, looking at these things too. She she works in the emergency department, and that connection, finding a champion in each of your disciplines, is a uh, um, is really important. And once we got her, we were able to do a lot of. Um, once she saw the value of it, um, I really see that as uh, a, as an important move forward. 
great. And it seems that you um, have um, a lot of different activities and, and strategies and um, work group work. Is the facilitator you mentioned, the professional facilitator, is, is, is that the person who um, helps coordinate all of the various activities and um, work groups? Yes, she does. And um, so the Health and Human Service Agency has a contract for facilitation, which pays for that infrastructure. And it really helps uh, just organize everybody's different activities. Uh, um, you know, each one do your own strength and we work on things together as a, as a collective whole. Okay, great. That, that's, um, I think, a unique feature of your coalition. Um, well, I think uh, we are out of time, and Linda, I want to thank you so much for your time and, um, and sharing all of this information. It's fantastic and really helpful to all of our coalitions. Um, for those who are still on the line, I would just want to um, let you know that we have another webinar coming up in, um, in April, two in April actually, April 14th from 12.30 to 1.30. We are um, going to be learning how to understand and use prescription and public health data. And so we'll have Steve Wirtz from the California Department of Public Health and Peter Kreiner from Brandeis Prescription Drug Monitoring Program.